Welcome to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. We had a little reception last night. We are prone to have those here on the Gulf Coast. So we hope you enjoy that. We hope you enjoy this beautiful venue. And uh, if you're not having a good time, it's your fault. So we're going to try today to cover as much about energy as we can. Because that's what we're all here for. That's what this is all about. This is what that new revolution Ken was just talking about is about. It is about affordable, sustainable, clean energy. I noticed when Ken was speaking, one of the things he kept using was the word clean. Now, I, I appreciate that because if you look out your window this morning, I hope you were on the side that saw that beautiful Gulf Coast, those pristine waters out there. And those of us that were from Mississippi, particularly born in the Delta, we just thought this was the most magic place on earth. Many of us could not afford to go to other places, and so we would get in our old cars. In those days, my dad had like this 62 Dodge station wagon, and he'd drive us all to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. That was before sunscreen, so we'd all get burnt up. <laughs> oh yeah, we'd have third degree burns before the afternoon and loved every minute of it. But this was such a wonderful, beautiful, exotic place for those of us in Mississippi. We loved that water out there. We loved those beaches. The so clean energy is a part of our soul and our lifestyle. Now, we suffered through a pretty disastrous situation here a few years ago when thousands of barrels of oil was dumped into that water. And all of us took to that fight. And that's the way we described it. We attacked it. We wanted to make sure we rescued our waters, our estuaries, our beaches. And I think if you'll look today, you'll see what a success that has been because of every Mississippian, because of everyone that was determined to make sure that we were not going to allow that to happen. So clean, affordable, efficient energy, those terms, but clean. You know, I often am amazed when I became governor, I said, you know, I really will, I want to be the energy governor. I want to be the big idea governor. And there are some people that think what you and I try to do to expand the opportunity for abundant energy is somehow not a, not a good job, not, not, not something that, that, that they're embracing. How can you not think of the millions of families in this country now that enjoy the simple opportunity of being able to turn on the light, to keep their food refrigerated, to keep their home at a comfortable temperature. Now, I remember the first time we got that air conditioning unit, that window unit. Some of you are old enough to remember these type of things. That was a pretty special moment. We put it in one room, all of us gathered around it. If anybody would ever come over to the house, we'd say, come look at the unit. <laughs> and they'd sit there in amazement say, look at that thing. My dad would put his hand in front of it, feel that air. It's cool. It changed the way we do business. Then people could go to work in tall buildings. We could expand our industry because we could actually cool facilities and bring in more high-tech industry and so people would not have to work in over 100 degree temperatures. It changed, literally changes the world. Look at medicine. What would medicine be without the energy that we're developing each day? Millions of people would die from dreaded diseases without it. I mean, everything we do from the morning, we, the time we get up in the morning until the time we go to bed is because those of you that are involved in this wonderful industry are out there striving, working hard every day for this new revolution. We can't let that go. We can't let anyone convince us that that's not a great work for our lives. That clean, effective energy is, is, the, is the driver for the economy in this nation. And we're so very close to getting where we never thought we'd be. I remember the Jimmy Carter years where I used to have to pull that Chevrolet Vega in and wait in line. I remember that. You could only go like three days a week and buy gasoline. So you just wait in line to get your little Ford Pinto up there to get enough gasoline to try to get to work on. And we had these guys, these Arab sheiks for the first time. We saw them. I can remember they, they were you know, dressed in robes and things. And everybody said, oh, we've got to depend on them. You know, because they've got all the energy, and if they decide to cut the spigot off, we won't even have enough energy to drive to work in the morning. How do we let ourselves get there? Whose idea was that? And how many generations now we've been dependent upon people in countries who don't particularly like us for our energy? We're dependent no more. America is leading the world now in energy production, and we're going to continue to do so. So I was very proud when I was encouraged and allowed and elected to be your chairman of the Southern States Energy Board. 
Because as we drive forward, as I think about the families that are depending on us into the future for jobs in this industry. Now you want to look at job creation, look at energy. Every time we began to expand clean, efficient energy in our states, jobs were created. And that's just not some low-paying, haphazard duty that they're about. They're in an industry that will provide generational job opportunities. That means a dad will say, son, you need to make sure you learn this trade so you can come and work here in this energy plant. You can come and help me, and I will teach you how it works because it's good-paying jobs. They've got a good health care system here at this company. They're going to provide you a good lifestyle. And you have to, all you have to do is come to work and help make sure that America becomes energy independent. What a great goal in life to get up every day and say, you know, my job every day is to work harder and harder to make sure America's energy independent. So we're going to go through a few slides this morning. I like to talk and move, as you can probably tell. Get you guys awake. Get your cold coffee, take that last sip out of it, let's get at it. I was going to talk a little bit about football this morning, but I'm going to skip every bit of that. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in counseling over that right now. <laughs> After this weekend, I'm, I'm giving up football. My wife said, yeah, I've heard you say that before, you know, until next Friday night. All right, here we go. Energy is the lifeblood of our country and the soul of economic development. Go to emerging markets. We've been to China, many of us. What are they looking for? Energy. They've got 1.3 billion people over there that are emerging into the middle class and they're trying to consume energy as quickly as they can because they know they can't get to where they want to be and they want to be like us. They might not say it, but that's what they want to be. They want to be like us and they have to have a lot of energy to do it. I was in Brazil about a month ago, another huge emerging market. Now they've got the largest offshore oil reserve in the world, so they're going to do okay. Don't worry about Brazil. Now what we're trying to do is partner with them to see if we can't get some efforts where Mississippi and Brazil are working together and certain things like shipbuilding. We do an amazing job here at Ingalls building ships. And, and so to see, to understand how large that country is, 48 million people, and how they uh, desire energy. And so yes, as you look at emerging markets around the world, you understand what the demand's going to be and how the opportunity for America exists out there. But it exists right here at home as well. Because our energy consumption is going to continue. Now, I was raised in a home uh, with conservation. My dad believed in conserving energy. Because if you got up and left the room, he would say what? Turn that light off. Yes, turn that light off. You don't pay the electric bill around here. Turn that light off. Absolutely. I mean, we were told in no uncertain terms, you know, if you waste that. And I can remember my grandfather had a television, Moorhead, Mississippi, and he'd only turn it on to watch the news in Bonanza. <laughs> Rest of the time, that thing was off. Oh, there's no telling how much electricity that thing's conserving. Consuming. And then all of a sudden, we had TVA come along, and there was this idea that back in those days that, you know, if you just buy the electricity, they'd put in the pole. I'm going way back, guys, but this was so amazing. So we got a light out by the barn, and it lit the whole area. My grandmother would call our neighbors and say, come see the light. <laughs> Look at it. You can see the tractor from the back porch. <laughs> it's changing our lives. And so those little folks out there in the country decided that what an amazing lifestyle we can have now because of energy. And this economic development opportunity continues from those Dark days where the light came on into the country, into the country homes until the times now we're putting thousands and thousands of people and Mississippians to work in the energy field. We just opened a new uh, development in one of our community colleges where we're training young men and women to go to work for energy so we, we can have the affordable, clean energy in the future. We're using the STEM program, science, technology, it, it, and uh, energy to make sure that we have that education, engineering, mathematics. So we have those educated youth for the future that can go and, and, and discover even more remarkable opportunities for economic development ahead. Energy consumption in, in the United States, China, and in India seems to be the areas that will be growing. Look at that red line at China. Can you imagine? Between now and 2040, energy consumption will rise 56% across the world. 56% increase. Now, in sales, you love that type of opportunity, but we've got to be able to, to make sure that we're there to meet that demand. 
Wars have started over the lack of energy. The absence of energy have ca has caused wars around this world before. Now, I'm not saying that's going to have the effect in China, but I am saying we've got to meet that. China and India will be the leading consumers of energy growth. Lead by expanding middle class and long-term economic growth. As we said earlier, that expanding middle class, and they want the things that our children want. They want the things that we wanted when the emerging middle class was taking place in Mississippi, and that wasn't that too long ago that I can't remember. World energy consumption, my fuel type, fossil fuels again. Now, I can remember, it doesn't seem like that long ago, everybody was saying, you know, fossil fuels are gone. We may have another 10 years, and then all the oil reserves and all the gas is going to be gone. Y'all remember that? It was maybe just 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So we account for 80% of the world's energy by 2004. Petroleum and coal will remain the largest source of fuel energy consumption. Let me say that again. Petroleum and coal will remain the largest sources for fuel energy consumption. Natural gas, oh, what a change that has made. It's revolutionized so many things that we do. The cost of natural gas and the low cost of natural gas just now it just seems to be driving the economy in so many ways. Natural gas, most rapidly growing fossil fuel, almost 2% per year. Uh, states represented the Southern States Energy Board Supply our Nation, 59% of the natural gas of our 16 states, 59% of the natural gas comes from us. 44% of its coal in America, 44% of its nuclear power. We are, in fact, powering America. Technology changes every day. If, if, if technology does not continue to advance as we see it into the, into the future, we will not be able to meet those numbers, that 56%. So, if you look at what we've been able to do with the Hartzell Foundation, Old Sands Agreement, that's where Governor Bentley and I signed an agreement to say, why can't we work together? We know we've got that state line, that border that separates us, but if we're looking at permitting, if we're looking at inspections, if we're looking at economic development, job creation and training, let's do them together. I, I have a very close relationship with Dr. Bentley, so why on earth wouldn't we want to do that? Why wouldn't we want to put people in Alabama and in Mississippi working together? Occasionally, I hear they marry each other. <laughs> the Tuscaloosa Marine Shell Play, our shell play in formation in Louisiana and Mississippi. I know there's a couple of companies here that are involved in that, and I want to thank you for it, because there is risk in this business, I'm told. <laughs> There's a little bit of risk in this business. But if those men and women weren't out there investing their lifeblood and taking those risks, we would not have found this new technology. We would not have had the shell plays that are out there now. Clean coal gasification, Mississippi's power facility, that, that will be an amazing technology to be able to gasify coal in a clean and efficient manner will absolutely change the world. Y'all know we have coal reserves here in the United States with the Saudi Arabia of coal. And it's not going to go away. I certainly hope it doesn't go away. But to be able to burn it cost effectively and efficiently, efficiently and have clean coal and the byproduct of it be CO2, which we then market to companies for EOR. Have I got enough acronyms going for you this morning? I'll throw a couple more out. Yeah, nuclear generation, expansion of Southern Company's operation in Georgia, and you said South Carolina as well? well. Sure, absolutely. The idea that, uh, that nuclear power it cannot, it is going away is just absurd. It's going to be more efficient. It's going to be safer in the, to the future. That's what we all want, isn't it? I mean, every one of us work each day for that clean, safe energy that is abundantly out there. And I think nuclear power is obviously a part of it. Wind expansion. Look, I would love to put windmills out on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I'd love for you to look out and see some of those beautiful things. I don't want to block the view of the islands, because it ain't worth that, but on the other side. Now, I'm not sure if it will work, but I'm for it. I'm not offended by the fact. Now, I know we make fun of windmills. I've done it, too. Let me confess while we're having confession up here. that You know, we sort of say, oh, those silly windmills, you know. Tree huggers are out there trying to make them work. I'm for them. I'm for them. I want to, and, like, and what I'd like to do is manufacture them here because you've seen those things. They're like 300 foot tall. They're tall as the Empire State Building with big wings on them out there. I'd like to manufacture those. I'd love to be able to see them work. So the idea that somehow we are offended or that we're not for clean energy like wind and solar is just ridiculous. If it works, we want it here. 
2011 Fraser Institute ranked Mississippi number one place in the world for oil and gas investments. Fraser Institutes. Now, I, now I will tell you, we have slipped to number two. Oklahoma, my good friend Mary Fallon somehow sort of got some technology and some investment going and snuck up there, I understand, but we're coming back. Let me tell you, because of my members and friends here and members of the Mississippi legislature, we've done some remarkable things we're going to show you in just a minute. More natural gas flows in and out of the state of Mississippi than any other in the country. I'm going to show you that map. We love pipelines. Pipelines are wonderful things. Even boards of supervisors love pipelines, and they don't like many things, but they like those. They get the taxes. You never see it. It's a beautiful area. It's kept. You can hunt deer over the top of it. It's wonderful. Jackson County is home with one of the top 10 petroleum refineries in the United States. Chevron has one of its largest refineries, so oh, about 45 miles, maybe 40 miles from here, in Pascagoula. It is a remarkable, remarkable refinery. I've been on it many times and see the work that's done there and the money that Chevron has put into that plant, into that refinery, to make sure that it's safe. You want to talk about safety and cleanliness? Go see it. You've got to go through a training course before they'll even let you out the front door. I mean, no one, no one is more concerned about safety and, and cleanliness and, and efficiency than are the folks that work at Chevron's petroleum plant. Grand Gulf Nuclear Power Plant is the largest single unit, and largest single unit nuclear power plant in the United States at Port Gibson, Mississippi. A lot of people don't realize what a remarkable job they have done since the 1980s there in Port Gibson, Mississippi at Energy. Abundant supply of biomass, absolutely. Coal and natural gases have led many traditional advanced economic development opportunities. We've got a company here that's beginning to use cellulose products to manufacture fuel oil and diesel. Gasoline, they've got contracts with FedEx and Chevron. It's called Keyor. Some of you may have heard about it. They actually take cellulose products, primarily pine trees, and turn them into fuel oil. And I used to say for years, years ago, if you can ever take a pine tree and turn it into gasoline, we're your state. Because we got them everywhere. I mean, it's the law. You have to own some pine tree. <laughs> if you don't, I can get you some. But everybody's got them, and we'd love to have them as a product. And imagine being able to use those as renewable fuel source into the future because, you know, those pine trees grow back. We've got them planted on our farm, and they grow. And you cover up the field with it, and you don't have to bush hog. It's a wonderful thing. And now we're using it for our energy dependence into the future. All production in the state, all production in the state of Mississippi has increased 42% largely due to CO2 EOR. 42% increase. Now remember the days, not too far in the distance, when people would say it's over. No more wells, no more liquid. We're just, that, that's a thing of the past. Well, we decided not to listen to that. We decided to use CO2 in our enhanced oil recovery process and, and increase it. Now Mississippi crude oil production, as you look, we peaked it out uh, in the 1970s. We were doing a tremendous job in the 1970s of production of crude oil in the state of Mississippi, and, and you just see the decline began. And then our technology kicked in. CO2 started. Fracking started. We started oil sands, and you see that upturn that you, uh, just about there in 2008. We also started reducing the tax on energy investment in the state of Mississippi. I learned this thing from Ronald Reagan. Reagan said, you know, those things that you cut taxes on, they have lower taxes, you sell and consume more of. The things that you raise taxes on, you consume less of. And so we started cutting taxes on uh, energy in the state of Mississippi. We started adding as many pipelines as we could. There you see is a pretty good map, CO2, oil, natural gas, and other petroleum products, and a vast pipeline system. More flowing in and out of the state of Mississippi than any other in the nation. Ever-growing CO2 pipeline will place Mississippi in a strong position for the future. Absolutely. This is a remarkable product. Now, I can remember the time when people would drive a well and they would hit CO2 and they'd just cap it and they'd say, oh, terrible thing, hit CO2. Now they're excited about it. Again, we took that, 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 that thing that everybody dreaded. Oh, no, we, we're going to produce CO2 or we're going to find it in the ground. And now it's a product. Now we're celebrating the fact that we have an abundant source of it and, and using an enhanced oil recovery. Legislation. I tell you, no governor could ask for a better legislature. 
Because it, it does not matter. This goes across lines. Democrats, Republicans, it's not geographically controlled by a certain segment of the group. The Mississippi legislature in large numbers say we believe in the energy works agenda that the governor had because we want more of those jobs. We want low-cost fuel. We want it to be a efficient fuel. We want it to be clean fuel. So what do we do? Well, severance tax reduction for horizontal drilling, another huge opportunity. Horizontal drilling, no one had ever heard of this. I would love to talk to the first guys that got that started. Can you imagine some engineer walking to the office and say, boss, I got an idea, we're gonna drill that well and then we're going sideways. Son, go sober up and come back and talk to him. <laughs> But just look what we've been able to do. Now, we've reduced severance tax of 1.30% for horizontal drilling wells, the first 30-month holiday or until it's paid out. Because that's the real challenging time. What we've got to do is incentivize companies to come to the state of Mississippi and take a huge chance on the Tuscaloosa shale play. And so I said, I can't incentivize you up front. You know, that's just too costly a play for the people of the state of Mississippi. But once you get it up out of the ground, sure, we can give you an incentive there because that's money found in the street. That's money that you would not have. People would argue and say, oh, well, that came out of the general fund. No, because if they don't come and they don't drill and they don't bring the liquid up, we would never have that tax. It would be in the ground. You wouldn't get, you'd get 3% of nothing rather than 1.3% of something. So we were able to incentivize that. Electric tax reduction for CO2. Decreased sales taxes paid rate on electric, electricity to 1.5 for oil and gas producers using carbon dioxide. Again, cut the cost of the electricity. So we're saving you money on your energy so you can discover more energy. Like doing that. Like doing that. Alternative fuel revolving fund creates fund to allow municipalities and schools to borrow no interest for the cost of purchasing and converting vehicles to natural gas. Now, I've been to two different locations. One is a, one of our fine cement companies who makes uh, cement, and they had about a dozen of their new trucks they were converting to liquefied natural gas. And it's it compressed natural gas. And it is a remarkable system. My dad was a diesel mechanic, so every time I ever saw him get in a truck and rev it up a little bit, you see that black smoke boil out of it. So I hopped in one of those trucks, rev that thing up, nothing comes out of the stack. Clean. I want one of those. I want thousands of those. And, and, and you don't have to change the oil, but about once every 100,000 miles. And if you work it about right, that uh, compressed natural gas comes out at about 90 cents a gallon. Now, does that make sense? Absolutely. On every level, every time, that makes sense. So we said we're just going to see if we can't give you an alternative uh, revolving fuel fund to help cities and counties for school buses so that we can get the safer, cleaner energy onto school buses. Maybe for if they own uh, trucks with their uh, garbage collection system, maybe we can help them with that, but incentivize them. Energy infrastructure revolving loan fund. Low interest loans allow governments to borrow for low interest to upgrade energy infrastructure going to economic development site. So you're a city, you're a county, and you got an economic development site, a factory coming in, and they say, you know, we've got to run a transmission line for about a quarter of a mile there, and I just don't know how the city or the county has the money to do that, but this company really wants to come in and do it. We're going to allow you to borrow money from the state of Mississippi at a very low interest. And so we can go out and expand that gas pipeline to the, to the back door of that company and hook it up, bring that transmission line in, get that company in there. Companies, one of the things, as you know, that every manufacturer looks at is what is my energy cost? What is my kilowatt hour? And if I can get it to five and seven cents around that delta there, I, we can do well. We can get companies that will come in and say, okay, five cent per kilowatt hour, I will take that. I will move in a manufacturing plant and I'll create a thousand jobs. If I say it's 17 cents per kilowatt hour, they're gone. We don't even get to talk to Yokohama Tire Company who looked at 3,000 sites around America in 28 different states and decided to come to West Point, Mississippi. TVA did a remarkable job of working with us to make sure we had that low-cost energy. Now a thousand jobs are going to be created there, perhaps more into the future, making Yokohama tires. Now you've got to understand that was the highest unemployment rate in the state of Mississippi. It changes lives. If we had not worked years ago to help generate the electricity to keep costs low, so that one day when Yokohama Tire or Toyota or Nissan came to Mississippi or Severstall, we could say you can afford to build your plant here. 
Thank goodness 20 years ago, many of you in this room were trying to work on technology that would help keep those costs low, get that transmission system into place, and help us make sure that we had the workforce available <clears throat> to generate the electricity to bring those companies here. Amazing how that works. Energy Sustainability and Development Act Sustainability is obviously so critically important. We want it not only now but into the future because when people put a billion or two billion dollars in a plant, they're not thinking about the next 10 years, they're thinking about the next 80 years. Like 60 and 80 years. So we've got to have, make sure that we have a sustainability opportunity. The elimination of electricity tax on manufacturing process. So if you're bringing energy into your plant as a manufacturer, we did away with that tax. You see, every little incentive helps. People start paying attention. Tax rebate for partner with higher education. So if you're an energy company and you come in here, and you say, we'd like to be a part of your landscape here in your economy of Mississippi, but we'd like to work with one of your fine research universities, we'll give you a tax credit on your product for doing that. Because we think it's critically important to involve our higher education. What matters in economic development? Secure energy supply and a robust infrastructure. You just absolutely have to have it. The reason Mississippi's economic landscape has changed so dramatically, and I will tell you we're number nine in the nation now for economic development. Area Development Magazine has us rated number nine. Now, I tell people if we had a football team that was number nine, we'd all have their t-shirts on. <laughs> we're number nine in the nation. The reason we are is that we started working years ago, and Kirk Fordyce, as Ken mentioned earlier, helped, helped kick this off help establish the idea that we had to have more abundant and low-cost energy into the future if we were going to change our state from an agrarian nature. And there's nothing I love. I love agriculture. I came from it. But change it into a robust, new, dynamic, high-skills, high-tech manufacturing facility where we make automobiles, where we have over 100 aerospace industries. But to do so, we had to have affordable energy. It has to be diverse. It has to be all of the above. And, and by that, we're not sure what the next big thing might be. But we're looking for it. You know, the, the idea that sometimes we say, this is the last thing we're going to do in energy. We better just take advantage of horizontal drilling. Fracking is working so well. We finally got all the chemistry working together in EOR. And that's it. Oh, no, what's next? Who knows? But I can assure you, if we keep driving to determine what the next big thing is, the next big thing will be out there. States know what's best. You know, every now and then we think the federal government has to come in and help us, tell us what to do in health care and in transportation, all those things that they'd like to centralize under a supreme federal government. But, you know, the states know what's best. No one cares more about their state, about their economy, uh, about, uh, about making sure that we protect the land and the water and the air than we do. We live here. We raise our children here. States know best. States are incubators of regulatory innovation. Our DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, does a remarkable job. They understand how important it is to be a conservationist, to have a conservationist governor, to make sure that we conserve, that we make sure that we go out there and protect our environment while we're generating jobs. State permitting is safe, effective, and timely. We're number two in America for permitting speed. Number two in America and Mississippi for permitting speed. Now that's not because we do it haphazardly, that's because we understand we have a sense of urgency and we must get out there and continue that work. And we do so. States must have a voice in energy development. Governors and organizations, other organizations like this with which you are, we must lead. We must be in Washington and say if you want to be energy independent, which is a national, I believe, a national issue of eminence. I mean, there's nothing to me more important than us being energy independent. It is uh, what we have longed for, and governors can help get there. America must embrace new technology in oil and gas. We've talked about that. Sound, efficient, effective policy must be added to the Keystone Pipeline. You know, I was with the, uh, the ambassador to Canada, and he was explaining, trying to explain to me how frustrated they were now, Canada is our largest trading partner in Mississippi. I believe our largest trading partner in the United States. 
We love Canadians, not always, but now we do. <laughs> now we do. And they love us. They want to be North America's trading partner. They, they, from, from Mexico to Canada, we ought to be this huge, massive energy production area, continent of energy production for around the world. And we can't get a pipeline in. We've got to work on that. LNG exports. We talked last night, I did, to some folks just right here in Pasagoula, Mississippi. We think we can begin to export LNG around the world again to provide that huge demand that's going to happen. The goal for energy independence. A goal is energy independence in America. That's where, what we should be thinking about, and I know you are each and every day. Because those countries, <clears throat> that hunger for energy, those that have an emerging middle class, are going to find energy. Now, they may be able to buy a portion of it from America and, and uh, LNG exports. How great would that be? So all of a sudden we're creating hundreds of thousands of jobs working in the energy industry that is helping an emerging middle class around the world? Now that's America. That's what, that's what we do. That's what we've always done. So that the world doesn't have to turn to tyrants and terrorists to get their energy. Because if they don't, if we don't afford it to them, tyrants and terrorists throughout history have decided that they will strike and energy will be at the heart of that cause. Now I know we talk, uh, everybody says, oh no, no, it's about religion, it's about this, about that. It's about energy. When, when people want it and they want it bad enough, they're going to find a way to get it. Now, our job is to make a safe, effective way for them to get it and be their trading partners. All right, I may be over my time, Ken. Look, but, Chairman. <laughs> I want to thank you again. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Welcome to the Gulf Coast. Thank you, sir. Thank you.